movie where J. Jonah Jameson makes his triumphant return to the Spider-Verse. Yeah, that's right. It's the most important thing that happened in this movie. Tonight, Brian and I discuss Spider-Man Far From Home. You got gifts, Parker. Stark chose you. Are you going to step up or not? Everywhere I go, I see his face. I just really miss him. I don't think Tony would have done what he did if he didn't know that you were going to be here after he was gone. How's the suit? It's a little tight around the old web shooter. Parker. Okay, I'll shut up. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at Jerome C1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. I strongly encourage you to leave a four or five star review so as to help people discount the show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you can do so in two ways. First, send an email to superheropantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at Hero Pantheon. My co host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. And Brian, we have two episodes left. Tonight, we are discussing. Spider-Man Far From Home, a movie that is incredibly the first Spider-Man movie to ever make $1 billion. So that is something that is worth noting right away. But I, I know that there has been a lot of discussion around this film since it came post-Avengers Endgame and the role that Tony Stark has played. And uh, Brian, I said I, I had a spicy hot take for you. I, I think this might be the my least favorite marvel movie i'm gonna i'm gonna think about it we're gonna we're gonna converse and uh we'll discuss and i'll we'll have a burning question and see if that's still the case by the end but this is uh this is definitely not my favorite marvel movie and i i have a lot of problems that i'm going to be bringing up throughout this podcast that's fine i mean going in like i knew this was not gonna be the best marvel movie to come off of endgame is like a really difficult thing to do so i think you got to lower it a bit have more of a comedic tone and that's what this movie had like it I think I laughed more for Spider-Man 2 than 1 uh, for Homecoming. I think this is much funnier, and I think the comedy's great, and I think it needs that comedy tone. Like, I really dug the awkward comedy tone in this movie, specifically. Like, I don't know what it is. I'm a weird kind of guy, so I'm, I'm up for the awkward humor. That's kind of my style when I, I make my friends laugh, so it just works. And all the awkward stuff with Zendaya and all the weird lines and the awkwardness and the all of a sudden Ned and Betty are a couple, it just it just fit for me in this universe because, I don't know, it's, it's a little silly, the Spider-Verse that they're trying to do, but that awkward humor, I think, makes the characters more relatable and connectable, and I think that's why they go with that. And then, for some reason, I, I don't know, I, I just feel really connected to... Tom Holland by like the end of the movie and then the way he's almost breaking down on the plane I think a lot of these elements work for me personally the only things that don't work for me in this movie is the stuff with Mysterio man and I think it's just a little too hokey and over the top and I really don't know what his motivations are but in terms of like Peter and like his core group of friends it's great and it's, it's weird that they're building like this whole side team too and that we're going to talk about that later when it's kind of this conflicting idea of what Sony wants versus what the MCU wants and trying to fit all the pieces together but um I mean, they have to do what they have to do to make, you know, Amy Pascal happy and set up all the other stuff with, like, Morbius and Venom and stuff like that. But um, it kind of shortchanges some of the other characters because, you know, uh, you know you're going to have to build up, like, Ned and MJ and all these different characters for the other Spider-Man movies probably in the crossovers. But then you got to build up, like, the Nick Fury stuff and the cosmic stuff going on and the and uh, the reveal that it was Talos in the end. So just all this other stuff, it's just they're throwing it out there. So I get why maybe it feels like an Iron Man 2 where they're just trying to connect the dots and fill all this stuff in. But for me, I think the humor really gets me into it. Like, I, I'm totally bought into the humor, and that's what gets me smiling throughout the whole movie. Like, I totally enjoyed it. Um, and then, you know, the stuff with uh, the mind fuck and the mind tricks that Mysterio was doing, that was kind of cool because of the visuals. So I was for that, except that just I don't know what Mysterio wants. 
I don't know what he wants. I know he wants to be an Avenger, but what happens when you join the Avengers and then you just can't fake all these events anymore? So I, I didn't get it. Yeah, I certainly think that this movie has a villain problem in a very different way, and I, I definitely want to address that at some point. And uh, the one thing I'll say is I don't necessarily disagree with anything that you said, Brian, passionately, but I, I think that for me, I think that the the issues come down to there is there's a lot of conflict that's going on, not necessarily within the movie, but just within kind of the meta the meta context and everything that is going on, and this idea that Spider Man is going to be the next Iron Man, and that to me is is kind of it defeats the purpose of, of this character because I think for the last 50 years or so, Spider-Man has, has been able to stand on his own and he's had two separate franchises unto his own. So I think that ultimately for me, the fundamental problem with this movie, it comes down to the fact that you have Spider-Man trying to be Iron Man and you even have some of the same musical cues. You have Happy Hogan involved. And uh, I think that's that's where some of the issues are uh, for me. Um, so let's get to uh, a few of the notes before we get into the categories. Mysterio was supposed to be one of the villains in Sam Raimi's canceled version of Spider-Man 4. He was to be played by Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell, of course, made cameos in all three of the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. I I can't imagine somebody better than Bruce Campbell. I like Jake Gyllenhaal, and Jake Gyllenhaal is a better actor than Bruce Campbell. But Bruce Campbell as Mysterio, all in. Yeah, I think they were going to go for the old school Mysterio as well, because the old school Mysterio was a special effects guy for movies and stuff like that. That's why he's so good at illusions and stuff like that, right? So I think that's what they were... I mean, knowing Sam Raimi and his love for films, that's probably what he was going for, right? And I can imagine Bruce Campbell as being this down and out, you know, almost like Michael Keaton as the vulture, down and out, you know, guy who's been working in Hollywood, gets rejected by Hollywood for, I don't know, a stunt gun wrong or something like that, just like the show, and then boom, you go from there. So I totally picture that. But again, that Spider-Man 4 was doomed from the start, because again, it, if you see some of the YouTube videos and, and read some of the notes, it felt like they were just going to do the same thing with Spider-Man 3 and just force his hand on some of these villains. But, um, you know, things change, and hey now, he's with Doctor Strange 2, so who knows, man, maybe it was meant to be. Uh, this is the first Marvel Avengers movie without a cameo by Stanley, of course, who had passed away months before, and his official last cameo came in Avengers Endgame, which I'm sure that we will discuss uh, a little bit about at least next week. Um, this is yet another MCU movie with uh, a scene that was in a trailer that was entirely absent from the finished movie. In this case, a scene showing Spider-Man defeating a, ba a gang of bad guys in a restaurant, he was wearing the nanotech Iron Spider suit that was first seen in Avengers Infinity War. This was a scene that was to be shown before the trip to Europe, but then was ultimately deleted, and it was then put back into the extended cut of the movie. I guess it was kind of a redundant action scene, but it just feels like we go quite a bit of time without actually seeing Spider-Man do anything. Yeah, I think they also there was a deleted scene that they put in that mini-movie on the Blu-ray with uh, him selling his toys as well. There's a little conflicting things there, because like, I feel like, uh, well, they should have left the cop scene in, I think, but I think they were just running out on time, because you look at the runtime, it's two hours and ten minutes, and then you got to go through the end credits to see the scene, so I get it, they, they had to cut it for time, but the stuff about Spider-Man needing money, and we'll talk about this more in the story, I just, I can't buy into that. The dude got handed, I don't know, he's like the second coming of, you know, he's this chosen one from, of, of Tony Stark, and you, you're, you're selling your Star Wars toys to buy a, a necklace, yeah, I can't buy into that. That that's that's total oversight and not realizing. Hey, Peter has access to all this money. He's got this jet at the end, practically. So yeah, there, there's some really weird flaws there, and I'm glad they cut that out because I I would have been just rolling my eyes like, dude, you got all this money that you have all this access to, and you can just call Happy Hogan, get all this money. What the hell are you doing? Um, I mean, I think that that is ultimately the problem, which we can get into later. I think, but we're going to put a pin in that because I think that might actually be the, the problem. I think you just may have nailed it. This is not the first time that Jake Gyllenhaal has been associated with a Spider-Man film. I believe we mentioned this when we discussed Spider-Man 2. He was going to replace Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man in that second movie because Tobey Maguire was injured while filming Seabiscuit. His injuries healed up. He was able to return to the set. 
So there is a world, uh, perhaps a, a multiverse, Brian, where Jake Gyllenhaal was Spider-Man in Spider-Man 2, the 2004 version. Uh, did you just describe the uh, hidden, deleted secret scene for uh, Doctor Strange 2? Wink, wink. Perhaps I don't. I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna have to see how that all develops. But I, I think it's pretty funny that Jake Gyllenhaal was supposed to be Spider Man in that Spider Man two, and here he's supposed to be an Avenger in this version of Spider Man two. So I think that's pretty fitting. Uh, this is Samuel Jackson's third consecutive MCU appearance as Nick Fury, or Nick Fury put it in quotes. He was in both Captain Marvel as well as the Avengers Endgame. This is also the first time an MCU character has appeared in. Three films in one year, and Brian, if you could believe it, this was his fourth superhero film of the year. What uh, what a year for Samuel Jackson as both Nick Fury and Mr. Glass. What's amazing is that he went on this Marvel streak, because Marvel did, you know, the short time span between Captain Marvel, Endgame, and Spider-Man, and the fact that, like, he was in all three, that's three $1 billion, well, $2 billion for Endgame, but still, like, $3 billion movies Back to back to back, and I know he had a small role in Endgame, obviously, but still, like, to have that kind of luck. But then all of a sudden, you hit June of the, uh, or maybe was it June or August? I can't remember. But Shaft comes out, and that's a total flop. But everyone ignores it because everyone just remembers the other movies. So, congrats to him for having a flop and so much success in one year. And of course, this was the official MCU debut of J. Jonah Jameson. Just absolutely incredible as. He had not been featured in the movies. He had not been featured in a film since Spider-Man 3, and he was portrayed by the same actor. How amazing. It's, it's, it's unbelievable that they feel like they can recast Spider-Man. They can recast villains, all of these various characters. But it's like, we can't replace J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. I don't know what that says, Brian, but it's really damn impressive that he got to play this role one more time. Yeah, and uh, I guess if you want to retcon it now, that it connects to Venom, because I don't know if you you probably blocked this out of your mind, Jerome, but Venom, at the beginning of the movie, saw the death of one uh, astronaut named Jameson, which is the son of J. Jonah Jameson, and they obviously can tie that in now, and it's all going to be confusing and whatnot, but it, it kind of creates that connection now. And hey, man, I, I said it on, the, on last week's podcast, if you're good enough to play multiple roles... Uh, you know, go for it. In this case, it's the same role, but he's so damn good at it that you might as well and just change the character. And they totally did, man. And they, we can talk about the story element, but he, him doing the whole Alex Jones thing, that made total 100% sense. And the way they approached it, and I was just like, oh, they're thinking because that's totally Alex Jones, and he's doing Alex Jones, and it just, it blew my mind the way they they treated it because that's also some kind of commentary, obviously, about the death of newspapers in this country, right? So, obviously, if they did the whole newspaper thing, they would have been talking about that, and that, you know, how how can I afford a photographer? How can I afford all this? Blah blah blah. So they just moved it to digital, like everyone else adapting to the world. So I thought that was a nice little subtle meta commentary, if you will. Uh, on even newspapers absolutely and yeah it's unfortunate and those the, those roles are even more going away with this pandemic being what it is thousands of newspaper people and magazine people have lost their jobs and it's it's terribly unfortunate because this is a time when we absolutely need good quality journalism and i think that this movie certainly raises that point uh, let's get to the categories. So I want to talk about the things that I really like about the hero aspect first, because I certainly will have my critiques. But there are two scenes that I think Tom Holland really just nails. And I think the scene specifically with MJ on the bridge, I think the way that those two characters are able to come together in that moment is really special. Those There are times when it feels like Zendaya is almost in a different movie than just about everybody else. And I think that she has such a weird energy to her that I don't think it quite matches up with what the MCU vibe is. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a negative thing, but she definitely brings a little bit of Ali Sheedy from The Breakfast Club and things like that uh, to a movie like this. But I do think she has genuine chemistry with Tom Holland. And I think that somewhat, regardless of some of the issues that I think come up, I think that that scene on the bridge really works very well. And I think the other scene that that works out is with Happy Hogan on the plane. And I have my issues with him being the next Iron Man, but the emotion that Tom Holland puts into that scene 
scene, I think works out tremendously well. And I think that the, the, what has made Tom Holland, I believe, the best Spider-Man, and I firmly, regardless of what I think of these two movies in some cases, I think Tom Holland has absolutely killed it as Spider-Man. I think he's nailed the tone. I think he's brought in a little bit of the snarkiness back, the fact that he is significantly younger. He's not moping around like Tobey Maguire uh, was in, in some of his movies. And I think he just plays younger so much, so much better. And I think that, you know, he's had a lot of really good scenes, even in some of the outside Spider-Man movies, Avengers infinity, where I think that that scene with Robert Downey Jr. When he's dusting is legitimately a, a really good performance, not for a superhero movie, but just in general, I think Tom Holland has, has been very good. I think it's unfortunate that the writing has not done him well. Well, I think that him being portrayed as a mini Tony Stark is incredibly problematic. I think it defeats the purpose of this idea of the neighborhood Spider-Man. I and and to me, I think that this is best represented by the part when he, you know, gets hit by a train and then he drives and he's kind of stuck in the middle of Europe where he basically doesn't have any resources until he could just call Happy Hogan to fly him away and then he can just rebuild his own suit. And I think you got that a little bit in the first one, but at least in the first version of this movie, he ultimately, he did have his suit taken away from him and he had to use his crappy suit. And that was kind of the climax of that movie was this idea that the suit is not who made him into Spider-Man. It was Peter Parker. And it feels like the movie got away from that and in favor of him just Tony Starking his way out of things. And the for me, the fundamental idea is that Happy Ogan even says that Tony Stark was a mess. And we've seen Tony Stark as a mess in many movies. If he is such a mess, why would anyone want to be the next Tony, especially given all of the employees, including Quentin Beck, who turn their backs and go evil? See, I think they address that because I don't know if you caught the line, but when he's being like uh, at that, uh, what do you call it? That I guess that Legion Hall place, whatever, we had that fundraiser at the beginning of the movie, and they ask him the questions. One of the reporters is like, um, are you going to be, you know, are you going to be the next Iron Man, blah, blah, blah. And then he responds like any neighborhood questions. I think deep down, he still wants to be that neighborhood Spider-Man. The problem is the world wants him to be Iron Man because he's like the last public hero in, in the public eye. You know what I mean? Like Thor's not there. They mentioned that he's not there. Captain Marvel's not there. And we don't even know what, because of the five years gap, we don't know like the history of like even the media acknowledging these heroes, right? So if Iron Man's not there, they know Captain America's not there anymore. Who's left? So all they have is like, oh, there's a Spider-Man guy. Is he going to be the next one? So I think that's why they focus on him, or at least the media and the movies in the MCU right now, because there's no one else, right? Like they have no one else to look to except for him. So he's taking on this responsibility. And then there's that scene when he's talking to him in the tunnels. Or he's talking to Nick Fury, quote unquote, um, and he's asking him, "Where's, where's Captain Marvel? Where's Thor? They're not there." And it seems like he's the only one left that can help. So he's the only one in the public eye. That's why everyone's kind of shoehorning him into this role when he doesn't want to be that. And I think that's the whole point. That's why, that's what I think he's trying to do. Is like he doesn't want to be the next Iron Man, but everyone sees him as the next Iron Man. He's stuck in that role, but he just wants to be the neighborhood Spider Man. That's why he doesn't want to bring the suit. That's why he just wants to have a normal teenage vacation in Europe. He's trying to be just what he was before, but because of the events of Endgame and Infinity War, things got totally elevated and he's totally out of his element because he's used to the neighborhood, right? And all of a sudden, everything goes cosmic. You know, things get out of control. So everything is just next level. And they talk about next level Avenger threats in this movie as well. So right now, it just feels like the world is getting too big for him and that he's just trying to be this neighborhood Spider-Man, but he can't anymore. And I think that's the struggle that he's going with, or getting, trying to get through. At least that's the way I interpret it. I mean, I think that's a fair interpretation, and I think if that's the direction that you want to take it, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's anything in the movie that would indicate that you're wrong about anything you said. I guess my, my issue and my interpretation is that Tony Stark is gone, and... I think that the thing to me that is inhibiting these movies from, I think, realizing their full potential, and I, I do like some of the comedy stuff, and I do like some of those elements with uh, the younger cast, but it just feels like Tony Stark 
is just in this movie way too much, even though Robert Downey Jr. himself is not in this movie. And I think that there are times when this movie does become a little convoluted as well. And I think that some of the writing feels very forced. I think just Peter becoming way too trusting of Quentin Beck to easily. And I know that that is something that he acknowledges toward the end of the movie, but it just feels like the Spidey sense and them calling it the Peter Tingle and kind of going for, for the cheap laugh there. And yeah, I just, I, I really feel like that there's some writing tricks here that I, I don't think necessarily worked. And I think this also connects to Nick Fury. I'm, we're going to come back to MJ and uh, Zend- Zendaya's performance, but I understand what they're going for. The fact that Nick Fury is not Nick Fury in this movie. It's Talos really pretending to be Nick Fury. But I there are times when Nick Fury can be cold and he can be a little bit on the prickly side. But like he's just being a dick to Spider-Man for no reason. There's no reason he has to be this much of an asshole to Spider-Man. And... I mean, it really felt like they did that specifically so that he would give the glasses to Mysterio and that he would give up. And it just feels like that they were really forcing this issue a little bit too hard. I mean, and again, I understand that this is not the real Nick Fury, but I don't know. There's just something there's something about that. It really feels like that there were a lot of contrivances in the script. And I also look at at Colby Smulders in this role of Maria Hill. I don't know if you've ever seen How I Met Your Mother, Brian, or if you've seen even um, the, the the ABC show that she's doing, Stumptown. But on both of those shows, Colby Smulders has a ton of personality, and she's very funny on those shows because she can be very dramatic. But she's never gotten anything to do with Maria Hill, no matter what movies she's been in the TV episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. she's been in, we really haven't gotten any sense of who Maria Hill is, and it it really sucks. And again, I know that Maria Hill is not really Maria Hill, but to me, this is just a representation of how much they've wasted Colby Smulders over the years. So for me, just the way that they use Samuel Jackson and Colby Smulders uh, was not a big fan. Yeah, the first time around before the end credits reveal, I, I kind of felt like this was like kind of off, this this version of Nick Fury. His game seemed kind of off, um, you know, with even like uh, Maria Hill kind of questioning him and making fun of him a little bit. And then once you realize it's Talos and his, I think it's his wife. I want to say it's his wife because they have this kind of weird chemistry of like uh, an older couple that's been together for a while and then you got the wife who's just like not taking – the husband seriously because the husband's just talking out of his ass kind of thing. And then you kind of have to take into account, and I'm not even sure, because I've heard interviews that Colby Smothers and Samuel L. Jackson didn't even know that they were going to reveal that there were Talos and, and the wife at the end, right, that there were scrolls. But I don't know. It just kind of, it's clear now in the second and third viewing that these are not like them. Like, it's clear that, like, Fury does not make these kind of mistakes and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know if that's what they were going for because it just seems so obvious now. And then it, what it is, it's like, okay, so Talos is just doing an impression of Samuel L. Jackson. So maybe that's the idea. It's just like Fury doing an impression of Fury because it's Talos, right? So that's why it's a little off. And maybe that's why it's kind of being overly dickish and prickish because he's he's playing into the idea and the legend of Nick Fury, not the who the actual person is. Because we know the real Nick Fury is probably going to have some cool, chill moments. Because if you look at the, the Fury in Winter Soldier, man, not nearly as a dick, right? And I guess it's just, you know, he's just trying to imitate him. So it's almost like when a wrestler is trying to do a promo and all of a sudden they start using all, all this stuff, talking like Ric Flair. And then, you know, or it's like when every, all these wrestlers copied like superstar Billy Graham, like Scott Steiner did that, right? In imitation of superstar Billy Graham. And then it got over on his own. But, um, but the original version, you know what I mean, is not nearly as, you know, of a dick, right? That's kind of the point. So I think it's just like them in the script, or maybe the script writers are just like, okay, we, we can't make him exactly like Fury. We got to make him c- kind of different because this is an imitation. So I don't know if that was the plan or whatever, but that's kind of way the second and third time around it kind of felt for me. So I think if you're not telling the actors if that is true, then I think you're doing a real disservice because then to me it's one of those things where you're not, 
it's it's hard to read their performances in in that way because if they don't know what's going on i just i have a real problem with that because i think westworld has kind of done uh, similar things by not revealing characters and having characters actually be other people and i i almost think the movie would have played better if they told the audience at the beginning that it wasn't them and that if the audience knew i think i almost think the movie would work better in that way, what do you think? Like, if they told us right from the start that they were pretending to be Nick Fury and Maria Hill, that I think we could have a lot more perspective. And the scenes with Nick Fury just being an asshole to Spider-Man would at least make more sense because then you could say, oh, this is Talos really just trying to be Nick Fury and he's just going way over the line. Yeah, I think that would have made a lot more sense to do it, but... Uh, you know, just the way I think there's this weird idea, or I don't know if it's an obsession, but this idea that you do a post credit scene and it's a scroll reveal. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's something like, you like that's like an end credits type scene, right? So maybe that's why they saved that for the end credits, because like, the big reveal after the credits, like, that's usually the MO of the MCU, some kind of big reveal. So if they did that, I don't know if they should have switched it around and maybe make the Jonah, J. Jonah Jameson thing as the end credits, because then maybe that would have worked even more. But... I think in hindsight, I think you might be right. They should have revealed him at the start, and then you can kind of get away with it. And then, hell, we could have got more Ben Middleston. So, there you go. Or at least it would have been, at least I think it would have played better. Uh, so, let's talk about Zendaya. It, it, again, I feel like she's in a different movie than everyone else. Uh, very different energy. And this is a good place to also talk about Ned. I don't know. It feels like Ned has even less to do in this movie. I'm glad they gave him a love interest in Betty and that they had some some very funny scenes involved, but I, I it just it feels like there was a lot of focus on the villain for obvious reasons because they were setting setting up a twist. There was a lot involving Maria Hill and Nick Fury, and I kind of just wanted to see more of Peter hanging out with MJ and with Ned. I mean, we had that little moment, but uh, I don't I don't know. I, I guess they specifically wanted to go away from that because the way they set up the beginning is like we're going to be American bachelors in Europe you know what I mean I thought that was a great line and then all of a sudden things go uh, south they're not south but just complete turn and then all of a sudden he's with Betty right and then you know they're, they're kind of separated out but I guess they designed it that way I don't know why but I do like this idea of like a spider family spider team kind of thing so I like that idea that it's revealed to MJ and I like that they're like totally going opposite of what we know as MJ, like this pretty actress that, you know, aspiring actress in in the movies and in the 90s show, she's just like the popular girl in college or whatever, and it's in high school, and they're going just completely opposite of that, and that's a great comparison, Ali Sheedy from uh, Breakfast Club, I think that's totally spot on, that's totally what that is, and I dig it, man, I totally dig that kind of vibe, like I said, I'm a weird dude who's got some weird stuff, but, you know what I mean, and I I dig weird characters, and that's why I think I dig a lot of the humor in this movie, just the awkwardness of it all, and she's very awkward, but it's funny, and it's cute, and they got that great chemistry, and especially you mentioned the scene on the bridge, so I'm down for it, you know, it's, it's like, it downplays your expectations of what we know as the Spider-Man story. You know what I mean? They're going away from everything that what we know, and they're switching things up, and that's good because, you know, it, it changes the expectations a little bit. You don't know what's coming next, um, and especially with that big reveal that they, you know, we'll talk about that later, but the big reveal of revealing his identity is another big twist, too. But uh, I, I like what they're doing, man. They're, they're changing our expectations. So um, after all that put together, I'm going to say my score right now. I'll give it an 8 out of 10. Um it's a little messy with with Marie Hill and and uh, Talos and Nick Fury, whatever you want to call them, but that's because of the big reveal at the end, and then the second time around, you kind of figure what's going on with the performances. So I do feel like I want to address Marissa Tomei and John Favreau very briefly. I think it's unfortunate that Mar- Marissa Tomei is basically in a bona fide cameo. Again, she has almost nothing to do because most of the action is in Europe, and she, we see her at the beginning, we see her at the end, and then we see a phone call. Uh, while they're in Europe. And 
I really wish that we had gotten more of her interactions with Peter because the way the first movie ended, we had a we had a big F bomb almost, and that really doesn't get addressed. We don't really get any addressing of the blip. A lot of the focus is on Aunt May possibly dating Happy Hogan. And I don't know, it just it felt very misguided and I don't I don't dislike John Favreau as Happy Hogan. I like him in the Iron Man movies, but I am hopeful that this is the last time that we see him in this role in a significant way. If you want to do a cameo or something like that, go ahead by all means. I really don't want to see him in the next Spider-Man movie though. I really I really want him to just not be a part and not be that mentor. I really want Spider-Man to kind of figure things for him, figure things out for himself for once. So that's my viewpoint and my score is lower than yours. It is a 6. I will let you speak on Marissa Tomei and Con Favreau though since you have not gotten a chance to do so. Well, I started thinking about this about a couple hours ago when I was eating my lunch, watching TV, and they had the Harry Potter series on. And I was thinking, like, it reflects Spider-Man, because in the Harry Potter series, he's always trying to replace that father figure in his life, right? So, yeah, it makes sense that Happy Hogan is that father figure now to him. Since Tony Stark's out of the picture, and then, of course, Uncle Ben, they don't even mention him, but in Harry Potter, it was like, what, Sirius Black, and then it became Dumbledore, and then once Dumbledore was out, he was all alone by the end of the 7th or 8th movie or whatever it was, right? I think that's what you want, and I think we're getting to that point. It's not exactly, he's not exactly a mature, you know, adult yet. He's still a 17-year-old learning the world and wanting to do all these things, so I think you still need that mentor um, but if, if you're going to have him, you know, still be in high school, but on the run, then maybe he doesn't need a mentor figure. Just like Harry Potter in, uh, I guess it was Deathly Hollows Part 1 it was, when he was on the run. So if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, I think at this point he doesn't necessarily need that father character in his life, like the Tony Starks and the Happy Hogan. So I think I think they get away from that, which is fine. I don't want Hogan to be totally gone. I think he's a great character still, and it kind of reminds you of where everything started. I think having him at least pop up in the next movie just here and there, you know, I think that'll be fine. Because, I, I mean, every time I see him, I just keep thinking, like, he was there from the start. And then, of course, I get all, all, all nostalgic when they played the, the Back in Black song. So... Um, you know, I'm not totally for him being out completely, but I think him still being there every now and then, maybe possibly giving some advice, not, you know, totally bailing him out like he did in this movie. I think that's fine. I guess we'll kind of have to agree to disagree and we'll see how this all develops because we are a couple of years away still from Spider-Man and there's a long way to go. Sony might not even be Sony by the time, uh, this, this pandemic ends. Let's get to the villains. Jake Gyllenhaal. I love his performance in the second half of this movie. In the first half, it kind of is very bland, and I think they're doing that consciously. I think for me, the fundamental issue was there is this idea in the first hour of this movie. And the thing that's so weird to me is that the MCU tends to be very smart about the way that they treat their audience. And it feels like this movie is almost done in a different universe in that Like, think back to Avengers Endgame and think about all the callbacks and think about all the references that get made that don't really get explained. Like, and the best example of that is in Avengers Endgame, you get that scene with Captain America in the elevator, and it's such a great scene. And you're thinking about, oh, is this going to be a fight just like the second Captain America? And he whispers, Hail Hydra. And it's got kind of this double meaning because it works within the scene and it kind of Hulk harkens back to a really bad comic book storyline. So it works on multiple levels. And it seems like they've really respected their audience. But the idea that Mysterio was ever going to be the quote unquote next Avenger and not a villain was completely absurd. And the marketing pretending otherwise was absurd. And that's, and for me, that really makes this movie not work because if you, if you are going to advertise this person as if you are going to say that Mysterio is going to be the next Avenger, you almost have to go above and beyond. If you're going to sell this, you almost have to go an entire movie before you actually reveal it. It seems like they were trying to do it both ways by waiting an hour to do the big twist I would have, like, just, I I really did not like this. I like Jake Gyllenhaal chewing up the scenery in the second half. I think that scene where he's in the lab with the drones and his compatriots and he's threatening them and he's going crazy, that scene I think is really great and Gyllenhaal just kills it. 
But for me, the Mysterio character really doesn't... It almost feels like we didn't get to see Mysterio reach his full potential because we had to see him pretending to be a good guy for the first hour. And then once he turns, then you get that incredible couple of scenes where there's all kinds of illusions going on and things go really batshit crazy. And I think that's when the character really starts to work. And we just... We don't get that in the first half. Yeah, I... I don't know why they did it this way, but they went out of their way to convince you. But at the same time, it's like the only I think the diehards would know that Mysterio was really like you could never trust them. You know what I mean? It's all it's all an illusion. It's fake. But to a casual audience who doesn't read the comic books or watch the cartoons, who just watch Endgame and see Spider Man and they just want to see the next Spider Man movie, they probably don't know any better, right? So I'm guessing that's the approach they took with the more you know, casual approach, right? It's like, oh, uh, you know, this average couple, they like Endgame or whatever, they're going to watch Spider-Man, they don't really know who Mysterio is, you can get away with, you can get away with, I guess, making, you know, these assumptions about a character if you don't really know about it, right? Or the history of the character, so maybe they thought they can get away with it. It didn't really feel insulting to me, because I was like, okay, where are they going with this? We know there's going to be a turn, how long is the turn going to come in within the movie? They did it within it an hour, and then, I don't know, I wasn't totally satisfied with his plan his motivations the performance is okay I think I don't know he was just going way over the top at at times and you're saying he's chewing scenery and I totally agree with that but um just that scene where he's in the bar and he's explaining the plan it's like that that usual thing where uh I don't know it just it feels like uh it's just why are you explaining the plan to all your people that already know the plan kind of thing and it's just like that whole thing about the villain explaining everything you know what I mean? Uh, I, I, it just got to... They caught the monologuing, Brian. That's what happened. Just like The Incredibles. I know, but goddamn, like, why... I don't know. I mean, it was cool to, to reveal that there was the scientist from the first Iron Man and blah, 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 but that scene just seemed so forced and convoluted and him going and drinking and making all those toasts and it was just kind of forced, you know what I mean? And then from there, you know, that scene was cool when he was, like, planning everything and then you know, double the damage and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, I don't know, it was just him yelling and screaming by the end of the movie, I felt like, and then I still don't know what he wants. Like, what does he want? He wants to be an Avenger, right? But then if he becomes an Avenger, he's actually going to have to, like, fight and do all these things and not just make fake events, you know what I mean? Like, shit will actually go down. So what happens when he joins the Avengers, you know what I mean? Does he want, does he just want Edith? Because he got control of Edith, so why even destroy London if he already got control over the tech that you wanted? So it's very confusing to me. It was what does this character want, right? We know what all the other characters want. They want revenge on Tony Stark, but Tony Stark's already dead. Like, what more do you want? You got the glasses halfway through the movie. I felt like they accomplished their goal halfway through. You know what I mean? So, like, what was the point of destroying London? I, I didn't get that part. Yeah, I, I agree with you on all counts. And I think that, for me, the fundamental issue is that it's just another Tony Stark employee. It's just like the Iron Man movies. It's just like the first Spider-Man movie in that it's it's more about Tony Stark than it really is about Peter Parker. And I think that that is another fundamental problem with the movie. And that's why, again, it feels like Tony Stark is so much still lingering over this franchise. So, Brian, I think that that, is, that to me, is the issue, is that the connect, I mean, and the thing that I appreciated about Vulture is Vulture had a connection to Spider-Man by virtue of the fact that Spider-Man was had a huge crush on his daughter. So that at least created a connection. Michael Keaton, I think, is gives one of the best and most outstanding performances uh, that we've seen in one of these movies. But I think that for me, I think that that is, that is why the villain doesn't totally work. And uh, I'm going to settle on a six for this score as well, because, again, I do like Hall, and I think his performance is good. I love the illusion scenes. I think that contributes to this villain score. But I think that if, if Mysterio was more related to Spider-Man in some way, I'm not saying his father or his uncle or something like that, but that to me is where the connection needs to come from, is these villains, I think that's what Sam Raimi did so well, is that the villains were always connected to Spider-Man in some way, and that is the issue, is that these villains have been related to Tony Stark. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm going with a five, because I just felt totally disappointed and confused and I mean I know Mysterio's coming back it's obvious that he's not dead like I'm, I'm pretty sure on that because I think Gyllenhaal coming back and 
being a part of the MCU. That's that's a good thing. You want that, and him being a part of the Sinister Six, and I think that's a good that's a good plan. So I think he's got time to build on this character. Just give me more motivation. It's just like I don't know what. I don't know what's his what's his goal like. You know what I mean? It's like, does he want to take over the world? Does he want to cause chaos? I don't I don't know what he wants, man. So, it's kind of a bad motivation. So I'm giving it a five. The story, I think we've kind of hinted at the story in the first two categories. I think this movie focuses again on the legacy of Tony Stark and less on Peter Parker's development. I think this time it's it sometimes tries to be a companion piece to the other Spider-Man 2 in the way that he is conflicted about what he wants. Does he want to be a hero? Does he just want to be with his girlfriend? So I think that that, is, that can be interesting at times. But I don't think the movie goes out of its way to really sell the struggle of him wanting to be a, a superhero enough. And I, don't, I do not like the elemental scenes. I think that those set pieces tend to feel really clunky and small. And I think the part of the issue is that they want to keep – they want to maintain this idea of the neighborhood Spider-Man. That's why I think they keep things purposefully on the small side. But when you're going to Europe, you are you are automatically ripping this idea of the neighborhood Spider-Man away because he can't be Spider-Man because he's trying to protect his identity. So he's Night Monkey instead, and you get some goofy humor that is, is part of that. And they seemingly try to retain this neighborhood feeling by also having this absurd European trip. And it almost feels like the movie is acknowledging just how absurd it is with some of the actions of, of the characters. And... I'm not sure how to feel about the ending. The ending indicates Spider-Man is going to be on the run because everyone knows who he is and he's apparently a murderer now. But for me, this movie so focuses on the various twists and turns, the Mysterio turn, the J. Jonah Jameson reveal, Spider-Man being a quote-unquote murderer, Nick Fury being wherever Nick Fury is. But to me, what when this movie is at its best is when there are actual real human connections. And I think that that's something that we have to get back to in the MCU because there are some of these movies where they have gotten away from that. And I think the same thing is true even in Avengers Endgames. To me, the most memorable scenes in Endgame, and we're going to talk, and I'm going to come back to this when we talk about Endgame next week, is the scene with... Tony Stark and his father, Thor and his mom, Captain America, and that ending scene when he, when he is finally getting his dance. Those, to me, are the moments that really sing. And even Ant- and when Ant-Man is reunited with his daughter, like those are the scenes that connect with me because in order for a movie to be successful, there has to be some sort of emotional connection. And far too many times, Spider-Man Far From Home gets away from those emotional connections in favor of some sort of a twist or some sort of reveal. I think Captain Marvel kind of falls into the same trap. I think this is an even more extreme version of that. Um, I agree on, on some of those points, um, but for me, I just feel like this movie has so many genuine good moments, like smiling, genuine good moments, with like the humor and like the stuff on the plane and the bridge. And like, to me, it just there's too much good to outweigh some of this. There is like not a lot of negative with the script, but some negatives, the negatives you pointed out. But I feel like it, 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 it just outweighs it because there's so many feel good moments in this movie. You know what I mean? So. Uh, I don't know. I I, I know that it, it, the script needed a lot of work. It's just they're just shoehorning a lot of things in. That's why I kind of compare this more to Iron Man Two, where they're just trying to fill in the gaps of like the MCU and explain some stuff. Um, but I think they just they were given what they were given, but still able to do this almost like this homage to you know National Lampoon's European Vacation, which you know I, I think it's an underrated comedy. I don't know how you feel about it, but. Um, I mean, I watched it in Euro class, you know what I mean, in high school. So I totally got, like, the references and what they were going for in that. And then, you know, just traveling around Europe, that was a cool concept. And then I love the use of, well, I could talk about the tech, but the use of music was really good. But I felt like it fit the story of what they were trying to tell, this lighthearted part of it at the beginning, and then things getting serious. But, I don't know, I just, I love the dialogue, especially in the awkward comedy. So um, it has its flaws, but I think I feel like I was just too too positive towards the end of it to kind of notice some of the negatives so for me i'm gonna go with a seven out of ten could have been a lot better but like i said i think they nailed 
the relationship between MJ and Peter Parker down really well, um, redefining the characters, changing our expectations, and then the stuff. I mean, I know it's twist-heavy in this movie, but it certainly shakes things up, and it changes your expectations. The fact they brought in Jonah J. J. Jonah Jameson back, the reveal that, you know, it was Talos at the end. So it, it opens up a lot of doors. So I'm, I'm not looking at it as, like, all these twists as, like, a negative, but, you know, it does kind of hinder some of the plot, but it does, you know, create a lot of opportunities for future storylines down the line. I'm going to give this a five. I just have a lot of issues with the story, and I think it's easily the weakest element. And I think you see a lot of the seams uh, throughout this movie, and, and it's really unfortunate. Let's get to the technical aspects. I think that this movie in so many ways is like a lot of other Marvel movies, but I think it gets redeemed by a couple of the Mysterio illusions. I think they are undoubtedly uh, the highlight, the visual highlight of these movies. I think the score is pretty solid. I really wish they would use the old Spider-Man score a little bit more. So I was I was going to give this a five just because I, those elemental scenes, I think, are just so unnoteworthy. But I'm elevating this to a six based on the Mysterio illusion scenes. Um, I'm going to go with an eight because when he goes inside, like the ending when he goes inside of the drones, I thought that was really creative and the visual concept of it all and the way that they put it all together. I just thought it was really great. And then the the stuff with the drones coming down, I thought that looked really great. And uh, I, you mentioned, like, the, the illusions and stuff like that. That was great, too. Like, just the trippiness of it all, you know what I mean? And kind of going with that Doctor Strange kind of feel a little bit leaning towards that. I thought that was a great concept. And then the Iron Man zombie part of it all, I thought that was really creative because that's kind of like a tie into the whole Marvel zombie comic line. That's kind of like a wink-wink, you know what I mean? So I thought they did a lot of good stuff there. Um, with the visual, and then you mentioned the score. I mean, we were marking out when we saw that first trailer when they played the original team song. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, my, might as well just do it. But they barely played hints of it, so I was kind of disappointed. But, I mean, the, the this score, I think it's Michael, what's his name, Giacano? Or I forget how to pronounce his la last name, but he's going to do the Batman score, and he already released some, he released some samples to that. So he's really great at what he does. So um, it's just not as memorable as some other scores, like the Endgame score. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the choice of music and using European pop songs or covers of songs in, in different languages and stuff like that, I thought that was great. Um, and then the little, like, some little Easter eggs I like they did visually, like, when at the end, when Spider-Man goes through the, the revamped Avengers building, and you see that they kind of redesigned it with that little atrium in the middle, giving us clues as to who it's possibly going to be. Is it Harry Osborn's building now? Is it the Baxter building? Is that going to lead to Fantastic Four? Little things like that. And then, as I recall, I don't know if I, I made this up in my head, but I think he went over Doctor Strange's house at one point at the end. I don't know if I saw that or just made that up in my head, but little nice Easter eggs, you know, how they do it in the Marvel Universe. So 8 out of 10 for me, and I like the way they put things together. I just wish they went full, you know, with that score, but I don't know if they, it's just like a licensing issue or who owns the rights to that song, but at least that we got it in the trailers. Yeah, I believe there was also a Fantastic Four tease that was very carefully laid in there as well, so they are always laying Easter eggs, and it yeah, so that's that's pretty much where we're at. I think the legacy of this movie, uh, this is almost the last Tom Holland Spider-Man in the MCU movie if it had not been for the deal that was reached to include another Spider-Man movie and another appearance in a different Marvel movie. We will see where that is all headed. Uh, so they're apparently going to try and shoehorn the MCU and Sony universes in some form or fashion based on what we've seen in a couple of trailers and reading some of the rumors. For me, this is kind of a Marvel movie that is toward the bottom. I don't think it has near the charm or fun of the first one, but it did still make a billion dollars, and this is the first Spider-Man movie to do that. So for those reasons, I'm giving this a six. Uh, seven for me, the billion dollar thing is a very key thing, but all I remember coming out of this movie and all my friends who were big Marvel MCU fans, especially some of the, my, my friends who were like, read all the comics and stuff, they kept telling me like, this is like a big moment for the MCU, this movie, because everyone coming out of this, they, they all felt like he's going to be the next Tony Stark, and that was kind of the vibe, but obviously by the end of the movie, it's not, you know, no one can be Tony Stark, right? But that's the vibe, and I don't know, it felt like... Spider-Man coming out was this big transitional thing post-Endgame, but it's more of like an epilogue, you know what I mean, uh, to the Endgame story. So it's not necessarily where we're going in the direction, but I can see why people are thinking that or were thinking that at the time. So I don't know if they're still going to go with that, but 
Um, 7 out of 10, and I just felt like coming off of Endgame two months and that build, and that I, like, I was, I don't think I was ever so excited for a Spider-Man movie because of the, what happened in Endgame, you know what I mean? Just all those questions and stuff like that. So I felt like we got spoiled. I mean, we got we got Captain Marvel in March, Endgame at the end of April, and then at the beginning of July, we got Spider-Man. We haven't had an MCU movie since then. We were supposed to get Black Widow, but I don't know, maybe, you know, this was probably a good thing because we've, I think we mentioned before the uh, we recorded, but, you know, Taking something away, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? We see it in wrestling sometimes, and I don't know. I think maybe it's sort of a good thing that we didn't get Black Widow in May, push it to November, make it, you know, over a year wait for the next MCU movie as opposed to, like, three to four months as it was before. So we've been spoiled, so I think this is a good time to kind of transition from that and kind of wait it out and kind of build up our interest again. So my total score is a 29. Mine is a 35, which I think is, like, almost the exact same score as, like, the first Homecoming, but I think Homecoming is slightly better, but still, I think this has its good, good, great moments, and, you know, some very, very good uh, comedy moments as well. I gotta mention J.B. Smooth, I forgot about him, him being just totally irrelevant and random with his comedy, I thought that was great, and shout out to him, because I gave him a fist bump when I was working at Whole Foods, like, eight years ago, and I told him he was doing a great job on Curb Your Enthusiasm, so... That is a total score of a 64, and I think this ends up being slightly lower than Homecoming, and for me, I think this movie is a a pretty big step down from Homecoming, a movie that I really enjoyed. I think Michael Keaton not being involved is one of the reasons taking it out of the neighborhood is another reason, and focusing so much of the movie on Tony Stark, I think for me, those are the reasons why this movie isn't nearly as good. All right, let's get to the burning question. So approximately where does this movie rank for in your MCU list? For me, it is going to end up somewhere in the bottom five. I'm going to have to really think about this because we will be doing our final MCU list next week. Uh, we'll be, we'll, I'm going to set that up as a tease, but uh, there will be uh, a master real world MCU list coming to, near you. So you don't have to reveal where it is officially ranked. You can give an approximate number, Brian, but for me, this is bottom five. Yeah, I would say between, like, 11 and 15, around somewhere we're going to place Captain Marvel, you know, around that kind of level. It's only a few points, or maybe a point higher than I gave Captain Marvel, so it's going to be between 11 to 15, something like that. I think I'm pretty much going to stick to my top 10 that I usually go with, and then after the, everything, everything after that is kind of like, okay, how do I feel, you know, emotionally-wise with this connect with or connecting with these characters or whatnot. But I definitely feel like this is more enjoyable than Captain Marvel was, so it's probably going to be around that area. What is Jameson's role in the MCU going to be? So if they're really going to go full Alex Jones with this, he's going to be saying some of the most ridiculous shit in terms of, like, you can get away with with a PG-13 audience. You know what I mean? I say if you're going to go for it, go for it, because I've heard, or read, I haven't really heard, but I've read some of the crazy shit that Alex Jones is known for, and I hate mentioning his name, but if you're going with that, go full out, man, and have him say the most outrageous stuff that you know is not true. But people are stupid enough to buy into it and buy into them, then, yeah, that's probably the message of the movie because that's kind of what's going on right now in the media. So um, go with that and make him outrageous and very unlikable because that's kind of what the modern (laughs) hot take, conservative, whatever you want to call it, media, you know, saying the most outrageous shit just to piss off the, the, the other side. So I think that's what he should go for. Yeah, I think that that's that's the direction. I'm not sure if he's going to be as actively involved in the movies as he was before, but I certainly think he is going to be playing this podcast role, and I think they're going to have him off to the side. And maybe that's what you do with J.K. Simmons, because he is a little bit older. I don't know if you can have him necessarily in the action as much as you did in the first three Spider-Man movies. Will this version of Spider-Man ever interact with other Spider-Man from alternate universes? Because, of course, there have been two other live-action Spider-Man, as well as the Into the Spider-Verse universe. Okay, I'm going to make this full circle with your prediction. I'll say... I'll do a double prediction that, let's say, Disney buys Sony, and uh, then that just solves all the problems, right? Then you don't have to worry about this two-picture deal that they signed initially, and then you got to, you know, like, what if, you know, blah, 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 we can't do this crossover multiverse. Now you can, because once they, if, if someone's going to buy Sony, like you said, and once they do, it's going to relinquish the rights over, and then you don't have to worry about 
you know, how many movies you have left to do what you want to do, and, and then forcing these characters. Now you can have all these extra time to do all these extra movies and build up to the crossover with the Spider Verse, and do it when Tom Holland is like in his thirties. I think will be perfect because that's that's you need him as the old Spider Man, and you got time to do it. He loves playing the role, so just have time to invest. I mean, Tony Stark was playing Iron Man for eleven years. You could have you know Tom Holland play Spider Man for fifteen. I think there is a distinct possibility that Netflix is going to buy Sony at some point, but I think Sony is going to get bought. They don't have a streaming service. They don't really even have a television network. It is very hard to survive in this environment without those two things, and they do have some valuable IP, not Spider-Man, but they do have Ghostbusters, and I think that they also have a lot of mid-level dramas. They also have television franchises like Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. So somebody is going to end up buying them. I think it's going to be Netflix. And when that happens, I think Spider-Man is going to revert back to Marvel. And hopefully things get better. And I do think that they are going to have them interact in some way. What is Spider-Man's future in the MCU? I guess this is a really tough question to ask. Because we really, I, I think a lot of it has to do with what happens between Sony and Disney and, and Netflix and whoever ultimately buys Sony, if that happens. But for me, I almost think that this is a, this is a hard question to ask. But I think for me, the way I see it is that he is going to be in either Doctor Strange or another Marvel movie, and they're going to write him out of the MCU. I think that is the current plan, but that I think is very much up in the air. I think they're going to embrace it and just because I think one of the things that people love about the MCU is all the connectivity and the, a lot of the backlash of them ending the deal before they remade the deal of the summer of last year was the fact that they were going to cut off the continuity with Spider-Man and we're just supposed to forget everything that happened. So I think doing that is a bad idea. You have to tie everything together and I think they're going to kind of force it but if you kind of take away all these litigation and you know the rights did the two-picture deal and everything and just kind of have the slate of like okay what's my spider-man plan for the next 10 years so you do spider-man 3 he finally he finally finishes high school they i think they got to do a college movie because i love spider-man in college that's what i want to see that's what i liked about the first two spider-man movies that's what i love about spider-man the animated series it gives you that possibility to do kurt connor's you know, as, as the professor, and then you get the lizard, there's a lot of possibilities there, but more importantly, like, I recently became, because of Disney+, Plus, became a big fan of Spider-Man and his amazing friends, and that's from 1982, I think, and that's him in college, and he makes friends with two mutants, and you got cameos from the X-Men, and Magneto, and all these different characters, but the idea of him having two buddies in college, and they're also superheroes, you can even tie that into the mutants coming in. I think that's a, that's a movie to do. Him in college, Spider-Man 4, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. You do that whole thing, tribute to the show. And then after that, that's when you can start building up to Miles Morales and the Spider-Verse and all those different things. Because I think, I think sooner than rather than later, we're going to get Miles Morales. It's being kind of like this thing. Because like I, I started even watching the newer shows on Disney Plus of the Spider-Man. And... After, like, I don't know, like, ten episodes, they already introduced Miles Morales, and you got both of them at the same time, and that's, I think that's the new approach they want to take, is having two Spider-Men at the same time, and you're going to get Miles and, like, a late 20s Peter Parker, so that's kind of what I want to see in the future, I want to see him in college after the third movie, do a crossover with the Spider-Verse, and then do whatever the hell you want with Carnage and Venom and some other side movie, but you can do an easily a big run of Spider-Man movies, every two, three years for the next, I don't know, 15 years, like I said, because Tom Holland still looks like he's 15, but he's in his almost mid-20s now, and, you know, this this is like ties in with Onward. Uh, I thought Onward was a great vocal performance by him, like, acting-wise, in terms of him being that young, younger brother, he still sounds like that. It really sold the movie for me. So I think he can play Spider-Man for a while and do all these great things. What do you want the third movie in this franchise to look at, Brian? This is the final burning question. Um, from what I'm hearing, I definitely want that Craven the Hunter stuff that you're talking about because that makes total sense, man. You're gonna he's on the run. You need a hunter, Craven the Hunter. Um, I mentioned I think uh, maybe a year or two ago in like some kind of random tweet that I want like an older Robert Shaw type, like the way Robert Shaw was in, in Jaws. That's the Craven the Hunter I want. Um, and then you know the other rumor about Matt Murdock being his lawyer. I think that's also perfect and give me. Uh, I'm forgetting his name from the show, but goddamn, give me that connection because I would mark the mark, mark the fuck out for that. And then just give me a graduation scene of him graduating high school. 
give me that scene so we can just move on from high school. The dude's been in high school for, I don't know, like eight years now because of the, the blip. So, yeah, and then it's been, what, one, two, three, uh, five movies now, and he's still in high school? we got to get away from that. Yeah, I think that what we need from a third movie is I, I want it to be a Spider-Man movie. I don't want it to be a Tony Stark movie. I don't want it to be a Sinister Six movie. I think the problem is that everybody is so obsessed with getting other things into these movies. They just need to focus on the character himself. And that's what I want the third movie to be about. And that's why I'm hopeful that Sony is no longer in possession of Spider-Man because they keep trying to shoehorn other things in. And yeah, I think that's, that's been the problem. All right, Brian. So next week is our season finale. We are going to be reviewing Avengers Endgame, and it will probably be a very long episode we may or may not have some special guests on that particular episode but brian we are very much going to uh, be approaching the end game literally for our podcast yeah and uh if you can go out and find those clips that went viral uh, a couple i guess a couple weeks ago by now of that audience reaction to the big scenes in Endgame. It'll get your emotions going, man. Because I I watched that and I got teary eyed again, man. And I I if yeah I got teary eyed the first three times I watched this movie or four times I watched this movie in theaters. So I can imagine me sitting in my in my room watching this, probably stoned and just getting really emotional because this movie gets me really emotional because of everything that comes full circle, the way the characters have their closure and the arcs and everything. Everything's perfect. And then of course I don't want to mention it now, but you know. Uh, the the hammer man the hammer scene was incredible and when i watched that scene again with the crowd reaction i it just gives me hope for the future of humanity so yeah so yes we will see what happens next week we will also probably talk a little bit about what our podcast is going to look like after we are done with superheroes because we are not leaving we are not done with with the real world we will be continuing the podcast We will talk about that more next week. So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast this week. We will talk to you all again next week for the big season finale. I think I'm going to listen to Back in Black by Led Zeppelin because that Led Zeppelin album is so classic.